I think George, there we go, there's a the recording. Um, so hello, I'm so glad you guys could join us tonight. First, like I always say, you guys don't get enough thanks. So thank you, thank you, thank you for everything you guys are doing for the, the educators and the students in New Hampshire. It's definitely not been um, a normal time, but I think things are starting to get back there. I know schools are starting to talk about, a lot more schools anyway, are starting to talk about going back full time, five days a week, um, and we're pretty excited about that. So thank you for everything you guys are doing. Um, we wanted to talk a little bit tonight. We have some guests with us from DC and I'm gonna let them introduce themselves in a minute. Um, but you know, we love having folks up from NEA when we can because they just know so much more what's going on in Congress down in DC than we do. Um, they're just so much more intimately involved with us. So tonight we just wanted to talk a little bit about the, um, American, sorry, one of the kids just came in, um, about the American Rescue Plan and what it actually means for New Hampshire. Um, can you tell Bryce I'm in the meeting? Um, sorry, <laughs> kids are coming home. Okay, okay, honey, okay, can you, okay, can you tell me about it in a minute? Um, <laughs> this is Bryce, don't say hi. This is my eight-year-old, he just had his first basketball practice. Not first. He just had basketball practice tonight, their first tournaments this weekend, so. Um, he's, yeah, we're, we have and a. I just got elbowed to the face five times and I have eight cuts on my leg, so that's. <laughs> okay. Love doing that. It's rough basketball here. And my other one's starting a private sector union for car washes for 10 year olds in New Hampshire. So that's, that's been my night tonight so far. Um, so anyway, the American Rescue Plan, we're gonna talk a little bit about um, and just see what it means for your district, um, what it means for your schools, what it means for New Hampshire. And hopefully we can get word out so that you can start advocating um, for you know, what we are getting out of this. So basically this is a $122 billion um, plan. It's in the elementary secondary school emergency relief fund. You might have heard them referred to as ESSER funds. So there's ESSER, ESSER 2. Um, our commissioner talks a lot about them on his Wednesday calls that are once a month now. Um, and those funds can be used to address a lot of the impacts of COVID-19 on pre-K through 12th grade, um, including different things like investing in resources to implement the CDC's K-12 operational strategy for in-person learning to help keep educators, staff, and students safe, um, to help improve ventilation, which is something we've been talking a lot about in New Hampshire, the, the HVAC systems and the air quality in the classrooms. Purchasing the PPE, um, and if you know, we've been doing a lot with the um, Scott McGrover Children's Foundation with the child size masks, but you know, purchasing more of that because even with the, the CDC saying we need to go down to three feet, you still have to have hand washing and you know, masks and everything in place. It can be used to obtain additional space to ensure that social distancing in classrooms. Depending on the level you're at, obviously the high school, it's gonna be a lot harder to do that. Um, some of the elementary schools in the small towns, it's easy, but when you get into towns like Manchester, um, you know, even Concord, it gets a little busier. And so it's hard to keep that distance within the classroom. It also um, can be used to address, you know, avoiding the layoffs. Um, it can be used to address hiring additional educators to address the learning loss, which I hate talking about learning loss. We just like to talk about it as disrupted learning um, because we're saying it's a learning loss on our own standards. So it's something we're putting on ourselves. Um, we wanna provide support to students and to educators, provide sufficient staffing so that we can facilitate that social distancing so that we can get kids back in school five days. It can be used to implement strategies to meet the social emotional um, needs of students and the academic needs that were hit really hard by the pandemic. Looking at things through evidence-based interventions, critical services like community schools. Um, it can be used to fund crucial summer after school and other extended learning and enrichment programs. We know that those are gonna be used probably more so than we have um, in the past. It can be used to hire additional school personnel like nurses and custodial staff to make sure we're keeping the schools healthy and safe. Um, it can be used for social distancing on buses and for safety protocol, protocols on buses. If we start having kids back in school five days a week, we're going to be having more kids back on the buses, right? Be cleaning and, and just everything that goes along with that. It can be used to fund for Wi-Fi hotspots and devices for students that don't have the connectivity for remote learning because there are going to be people who still keep their kids home for remote learning, even if we go back five days a week. And that's their choice. That's fine. Um, but we need to make sure that they have that technology. Even with all the broadband access that's been talked about in New Hampshire, there's still a lot of communities 
where we're not getting that connectivity. I know, I mean, I live right in Concord and on remote days with my kids when they're here, in the morning with the three kids on devices plus me working remote, you can ask Brian how many times I've said I've been kicked off internet. I mean, and that's, you know, right in the middle of Concord. So it's not even, you know, out in the, in the rural areas. Um, we also want to support education on development too, because I've gone like the de professional development that's going out through the district. Sometimes it's just like so many people are logging on to whatever program, which is usually free. And then we just totally like, everything collapses and then you can't get on for the rest of the day. So it's not yeah. just the students, it's the staffing as well. Right, exactly. And then also just to, you know, support educators, like you said, but in the using of the technology as well. And then just additional uses as the statute allows. So basically New Hampshire is set to receive $350,501,633 from that um, fund. So with that, I think one of the kids just fell outside. So I'm gonna um, turn it over. <laughs> <laughs> to her NEA folks. I'm just going to mute myself for one quick minute. Um, I apologize for this. And um, I'm going to let them go on um, further. So, thank you. All right. Thanks, Megan. All right. Bear with me. So, again, I'm Tom Zumbar with education policy and practice at NEA headquarters. I need to make one adjustment here. Okay, see the screen okay? All right, very good. So again, thanks very much uh, for inviting me. Uh, happy to be here. Uh, thank you, NEA New Hampshire. Uh, but now it begins. So the hard work of getting this historical legislation completed is behind us, right? And it is historical. But the hard work ahead, I would argue perhaps the bigger task is still ahead of this, which is implementing it. And hopefully with educators leading the way. Um, as, as they say, you don't light a lamp and then put it under a bushel basket. So we need to bring the light on what this federal law can do to every school. So we need your help in that. I, I appreciate and understand all the important issues you deal with in your own state. Uh, we get that. But hopefully, you'll also agree that this, this bill can be transformative. And uh, we want to make sure our members know it and remember who passed it and who made it happen. So with that, let me, let, we'll talk a little bit about how we can use your help. But first, let's cover some of the basics. And although I will, I will be discussing largely uh, the American Rescue Plan that Megan, of course, just mentioned, our ARP. Uh, primarily, I'm also going to be talking about the two prior laws as well, because they are all related and, it, and they will um, uh, intersect in many ways. So first, right, it's the ARP is the third and largest of the three federal emergency aid bills providing support to public education, right, in response to the pandemic. We know the CARES Act was signed into law uh, in March of last year. In fact, we're actually a few days from the first anniversary of that law, believe it or not. So we've gone a whole year now. The COVID relief bill in December, and I apologize for this, I didn't name it, but the, the, the acronym, if you will, we'll call it SIRSA, that was signed into law again in late December. And then again, the ARP was uh, signed into law on March 11th of this year. So all three laws contain a fund dedicated to elementary and secondary education, right, ESSER. And Ma Megan mentioned it at the, at the outset. So in addition, the CARES Act and the December COVID relief bill, or SIRSA, also included funding that the governor controls, right, the, they went by the wonderful name GEAR, um, that it can also be used to support K-12 education, but the governor, again, can also use it for higher education and to provide money to other education related entities for various emergency services. So the real dedicated fund for elementary and secondary education is what is, goes by the ESSER fund, the Elementary and Secondary School Emergency Relief Fund. All right, so specifically the ARP, 
again, Megan mentioned it at the outset, includes about 123 billion, again, directly for elementary and secondary schools. That's public schools. That works out to about $2,400 per public school student nationally on average, about $2,400, all right? Grant awards to states will be in the same proportion as each state received under Title I Part A. Same process that was used under the CARES Act, same process is used under the COVID relief bill in December. And that's where I'm saying there is a lot of intersection and overlap between the three bills. The good news is same allocation process. And in fact, last Wednesday, the uh, US Department of Education released the state allocations, which again, Megan mentioned um, at, the, uh, at the outset. And we anticipate that those dollars are gonna to begin to flow very soon, approximately two thirds of those or so. And then the additional third will flow later uh, upon completion of an application. So again, the department's still working through that process. But that's the details that we have at this juncture. Um, the state educational agencies, right, of, the, of their grant award, they need to allocate not less than 90% of their grant awards to local educational agencies. Again, the same process that was used under the prior two bills. And again, the allocation formula there is the same as before, which is in proportion to the amount of funds that the LEA received under the Title I Part A program. All right, it's important to kind of note that although the funds flow via the Title I formula, they are not actually Title I dollars, right? So they do not have to comply with Title I requirements. Instead, and, and Megan ticked off numerous uses um, of, of the funds. And, and so again, just to make sure that there's clarity on that point, that they flow via the Title I formula, but they are separate funds that must be accounted for separate from the Title I program. They do not have to adhere to those requirements. Um, then, there, obviously, then the state retains up to 10% of the award. So at least 90% must flow to LEAs. The state retains about 10%. It's known as the SEA reserve. And again, it's for its own discretionary purposes. So here's, here's the key numbers that you're probably most interested in. And, and again, Megan already mentioned the 350.5 million that's coming through the ARP. I've included the two prior bills, and so you see all told it's over 544 million coming to New Hampshire, which works out to approximately about $3,000 per pupil. Okay, and I've provided a kind of a timeline on the period of availability for each of the three major pieces of legislation. And you'll see the solid line, right, that runs for, for instance, under the CARES Act. Uh, the uh, period for obligation runs until about September 30th, 2021. There happens to be this technical uh, provision that uh, called the tidings period that allows the U.S. Department of Education to extend the funding for an additional year, which under their guidance, they've actually done that under both the CARES Act and the December COVID relief bill. So if you look in, uh, if you would happen to look up in the legislation, the actual period of availability, you'll see it says under the CARES Act through September 30th, 2021. But in fact, those funds can actually be extended by LEAs through September 30th, 2022. Same thing goes for the SERSA funds, December COVID relief bill. And also I assume the same thing is going to occur for the ARP funds, which then means it can stretch those funds out all the way to September 30th of 2024. All right, so that's, that's important to know. So again, approximately $3,000 per student on average in um, New Hampshire. Um, a couple other things you'll see at the bottom um, of the page, bring that up just a tad there, kind of breaks down again under the three bills, the uh, minimum distribution that's required to go to LEA. So again, almost 490 million and the amount, the maximum amount that the um, state can reserve for its own purposes, which is a little bit over 54 million. So again, Megan ticked off many of the uses. This page just simply captures 
in very abbreviated form what many of those uses are. One of the most important changes to the ARP that you should be aware of is that once LEAs get their allocation under the formula, they're required to provide not less than 20% of their funds to address learning loss. And again, I say that in quotes, that's what's written in the law. It is true, we do not like that terminology. We prefer disrupted learning, interrupted learning, learning recovery, et cetera. But nonetheless, using that term because that's the term that's used in the law. So learning loss, at least 20% much, uh, must be used for that. Um, and again, that is, we're mainly focusing again on the ESSER fund, that is the dedicated funding that goes to elementary and secondary education. Also, it's, it's good to know now that there is uniformity across the three funds in terms of uses. So under the COVID relief bill, there was additional uses enumerated in the bill. You'll like this one. One, of course, was regarding um, air quality and ventilation systems in schools. That was not necessarily specifically cited under the CARES Act. It was under the COVID relief bill or SIRSA in December. Likewise, the new ARP includes an additional provision that talks about um, protocols in line with the CDC's re recent guidance. Okay, the good news is that those, what are so-called additional provisions on fund uses, allowable fund uses that were added in those subsequent bills are also applicable to the original CARES dollars. So again, there, there is no uh, differences in terms of allowable fund uses across all three laws. And, and I think that's helpful uh, when you have discussions with district uh, officials, state officials, et cetera, school folks in terms of allowable uses of the funds. Um, just like the LEA is required for their portion of the, um, of the ARP funds to set aside at least 20% for to address learning loss, the SEA itself of its reserve of the no more than 10% that it holds on to, it's required to reserve at least 5%, again, to address learning recovery, also, the state is required to set aside 1% for summer enrichment programs and not less than 1% for comprehensive after school programs. So specific set asides that did not exist under the prior two, uh, prior two laws. And uh, there's a cap on their administrative costs. So, so although it's not shown, of course, on, on this slide, just so you know, for just some level of, of context, the minimum amount that SEA, the, the SEA and the LEA in New Hampshire must devote to address, again, learning recovery, would be around 88 million out of that total that we, we looked at before. A couple other provisions that I want to share with you. Again, the main focus here was, again, the dedicated funding for elementary and secondary education. Uh, the Secretary of Education is required under the ARP to uh, reserve 800 million to address the needs of students experiencing homelessness. So that is a separate cutout or set aside for that purpose. Also, unfortunately, uh, unfortunately and regrettably, uh, there is 2.75 billion again, reserved for emergency assistance to non-public schools that reared up in the COVID relief bill in December. Again, there was 2.75 billion for that purpose then there is 2.75 billion for that purpose under the ARP. The good news is there is no equitable services provision then under the uh, ESSER fund. And, and again, as you saw on that prior screen, just to make clear, again, I apologize for this terminology, but under the CARES Act, it was just called the ESSER fund. Under the COVID relief bill in December, it's called the ESSER II fund. And now under the ARP, it's called the ARP. ESSER fund. So all three funds, but again, a lot of commonality um, among them that I think it's, it's helpful to know. A um, couple other things there, if for, for your interest, there is 39.6 billion in grants for institutions of higher education. Again, under the same terms and conditions uh, for the funding that was provided under the uh, HERF II fund <laughs> to the COVID relief bill in December. Um, and uh, institutions in this instance are required to 
share at least half of the funding uh, as emergency financial aid grants for students. There uh, is no provision, just like there was no provision in the, under the CARES Act or the COVID relief bill in December uh, to prevent supplement, uh, supplanting of state and local dollars with these federal dollars. So there is no provision that, provision that prevents that. Just as under the CARES Act, just as under the COVID relief bill in December, if a state chooses to, they can supplant, and a district for that matter, state and local funds. So want to bring that to your attention. Obviously that's something that we want to fight, uh, but you need to be aware uh, of that if you aren't are already. What helps mitigate against that to some degree, not as extensively as we would like, is that there are there is, just like there was in the prior bills, a maintenance of effort requirement that does, again, prevent full-fledged supplanting. So again, the, the state, so for example, hypothetically, if uh, the state spent over the average of 2017, 18, and 19, 26% of its state budget on K-12 education, it must maintain that same proportion, that same percentage, 26%, in fiscal years 2022 and 2023 under ARP. And the, that's an, an additional year out from the COVID relief bill in December which had the same provision. The CARES Act was slightly different. So unfortunately, there is, there is a little separation between the CARES Act when it comes to maintenance of effort and the latter two bills. So just be aware of that. Also, another provision, which, I'll mention, which I was initially gonna mention in a moment, but I wanna bring up now, that was absent from the first two bills, is 350 billion in direct aid to state and local governments, general relief. So again, we're hoping that with this infusion of funds, there will be less likelihood that a state would take the action of supplanting the funds. Again, it's not a guarantee, but the combination of those dollars that were not in existence before, but now are available, and the maintenance of effort requirement, we hope will help mitigate some of that. Um, interesting, there is, something that we were in favor of, there is a maintenance of equity requirement. So not effort, equity. So essentially fiscal equity guardrails to prevent state budget cuts, should they happen, from disproportionately impacting high poverty school districts and low-income students, right? A lesson learned from what occurred in, in the fallout of the Great Recession after the Recovery Act money disappeared States were facing that fiscal cliff back in 2011, 12, 13. They drastically cut state funding. Districts disproportionately dependent on those state dollars were disproportionately harmed. So there's a provision in here to prevent that. It's a bit complex. Happy to talk about it later if anybody's interested. Another good provision, three billion was added to the ARP for state gra uh, grants under both parts B and C of the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act. So those are supplemental funds uh, for fiscal year 2021. And beyond the US Department of Education uh, funding, there were some other uh, individual programs um, that were funded, but more importantly, there is, uh, so you know, 15 billion for the Child Care and Development Block Grant, nearly 24 billion in Child Care Provider Stabilization Funds, and finally, a billion for the Head Start program. Again, those are all administered by HHS. Finally, so again, we mentioned another critical piece was that aid, 350 billion to state and local governments. And as Megan mentioned too at the outset, with a lot of work done by the great government relations team at NEA, uh, we helped secure 7.2 billion for the E-rate program to enable eligible schools and libraries to provide, among other things, uh, connected devices, internet service, and Wi-Fi hotspots to students and educators for internet use at home. So I will stop there, and I'm happy to entertain any questions. Thank you. Appreciate your time.
Um, did you say that uh, as a result of um, this latest bill that all of the federal money that's passed in the last three packages for education now has the same allowable usages? Yes. Okay. Yeah, so he, yeah, it's, uh, I was pleasantly surprised to see that in the brief uh, fact sheet that the department released uh, last Wednesday with the allocations to states under the ESSER, ARP ESSER fund. Um, they specifically mentioned that. That again, be, because again, in a sense, it's, it's nothing new. Many of those uses, although it wasn't widely known, so I, I kind of quibble with their presentation on that, but that these were allowable uses already, they just weren't as widely known. So they're making that explicit now. Thanks. Sure. Uh, and just a follow up on um, one, of, one of the issues that we heard a lot uh, that wasn't done in the um, December bill, but what, but was included in here, at least voluntarily, was um, tax credits for uh, paid family and medical leave for COVID reasons. I was wondering if you could touch a little bit on that, if, on that and um, what that means for school district employees. Yeah, and, and that's a good question, Brian. I, I'll, I'll be candid with you. Um, I've been so focused on the education-specific provisions that, that um, I can't necessarily add any more than um, what uh, we've already provided in the document that I think George is also going to be providing post-call. Um, but I'm happy to um, send you, <laughs> I apologize, not be able to share it to everybody here, additional uh, facts on that, but just not prepared at the moment to go into depth on that. Thanks. Sure. So is there yeah. any other? Yeah. So there was a question that came up in, in, the, in, in one of the chats. I'm just going to forward it to you, Tom. It, should states be advocating for educator input into um, state decisions on spending these funds? Yeah, absolutely. A absolutely. So again, there is nothing preventing that, it, you know, in the legislation. There's also nothing necessarily encouraging that, but again, um, you know, proceed to apprehend it. So, you know, what might be helpful too, not to prolong this unnecessarily, but if you have any feedback, um, I, you know, obviously I pushed a lot of information toward you, but I'm also eager to hear from you about what you're hearing. I know that one of the concerns obviously was, has been about supplanting across the country. Another is once the CARES Act was passed, you know, there was a lot of uncertainty uh, claimed by a lot of district officials. And maybe not altogether um, in air, be because we went months again before there was additional federal aid, right? And they had, for many of those that had gone through the experience of the Recovery Act, one and done essential federal effort, right? At the Great Recession, they were hit with the fiscal cliff. So we were hearing that a lot of districts were kind of holding the money in reserve. Again, being uncertain about what was to occur. Well, obviously then we had the follow-up December bill. And now of course the gusher that's coming from the ARP. So if you're hearing uh, from district officials in particular saying, well, they, there's still uncertainty, that, that's a harder argument to, to make, right? Understandably, though, we, that these are fairly one-shot funds. But as you saw in that period of availability, we know that the needs that have uh, erupted from the pandemic are not going to be resolved in, with extended learning, some enrichment programs this coming summer alone, right? There are needs that are to go to the next few years. So, uh, you know, there's a balancing act, and I surely don't want to steer one way or the other because it's a local issue and, and it's going to affect your situation specifically. So there's an urgency about getting the funding out there to allow state and district officials to plan, hopefully in coordination and collaboration with educators. But there's also the need that's going to run for a couple of years. So there's kind of that balance. So the period of availability to actually obligate or commit those funds 
does extend for multiple years because the need is going to be there. At the same time, some of you may have more urgent needs. So um, just wanted to put that on, on the table. Not sure what the impact is and what you're hearing in New Hampshire. Um, but there, there's a little bit of a tension there, but I just wanted to bring that to your attention as well. There are a couple more questions that, that came up. Um, if I can just read them to you. Uh, is there anything in the bill that extends leave for teachers and paraprofessionals that have child care issues? Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'm going to have to um, check that in more depth in terms of what the specifics are around leave. For child care, yeah, um, but I'm making a note of it actually right now. So thank you. And the next one is just so much fun to be here in New Hampshire. But I don't know if you you know or not. But any information or advice on regarding Mackenzie Snow, who was recently appointed uh, from the about the Voss administration into the uh, Edelblum? You can't laugh about that, Tom. There's, there's no <laughs> laughing about that. <laughs> Sorry, I, yeah, I'm, I'm 0 for 3 on, um, on, on a couple of those questions, and I'm going to remain, it, it, okay. this makes it 0 for 3 on that one. So what we can do also is if there's other questions that maybe you have after or other people have, we can always, um, if you email them to us, we can get them down um, to Tom and get answers for you. Um, did we, are we going to share the um, information that was out there earlier? George, did we already talk about that? Um, we did. Uh, I think what we're going to do is I'm going to put it up there with um, uh, when we put this on the on the website tomorrow. Um, all the all the files will be there. Um, Tom and I were talking before okay. the talk about some updated information, so I'll make sure what I send out is the most up to date. So Perfect. tomorrow, when this becomes uh, resident on YouTube and our website, the files will be okay. next week. Great. So any other questions? So I just realized, you know, there was a lot more light outside when I started. So I apologize. <laughs> right? <laughs> Dark backdrop now. <laughs> you know, I'm not really okay. paying attention. So I, I see it now. My apologies to everyone. <laughs> no worries. I think I have all the light on mine for my kitchen lights that took it from yours. So we're good with that. 